Hello my lovelies and welcome to my channel. Today malicious compliance and unfortunately I am now presenting the last two stories from Musa Hippo Singularity. I am really going to miss this guy. Please sit back, relax and enjoy. Our first story. You screwed up your load and need me to add more cement. Sure, just pull that nice clean shiny truck under the plant. When you mix a load of concrete, there are a lot of variables that determine the mix strength, but the two most important ones are A. The amount of water and B. The amount of cement. Adding water raises the slump or fluidity of the concrete and makes it easier to work, but it also raises that water slash cement ratio, dropping strength. To get around that you can add a water reducer a chemical made to raise slump without changing the water slash cement ratio. High range water reducers, also known as superplastizers, can turn curb mix concrete into absolute snot without weakening it at all. I'm not sure on the reasons why, but unlike other admixers, including low and mid range water reducers, superplastizers go in at the end of the loading sequence. That means that when the load finishes, the chemical hasn't had time to work its way into the load until it gets mixed in. The slump meter inside the truck will still register the load as being dry. And that brings us to Jake. Now Jake is not an inexperienced driver. He's been in the industry since I was in grade school. Most of that time, however, was spent with another company. He came to us because Jake likes to keep his truck clean really clean, like Adrian Monk thinks you have a problem clean. After many years and several warnings, his previous employer got fed up with how much clock time he was spending washing his truck and let him go. We were happy to have him because he knows what he is doing and is willing to advise less experienced drivers and of course his truck always looks fabulous. Unfortunately he's also a bit abrasive and set in his ways. Dealing with Jake always begins well, but after a while, he starts getting under your skin, and before you know it, you're really irritated. It's like stepping out of the shower and treating yourself to the fluffy pink caress of Owen's Corning's finest. So Jake pulls under the plant and gets loaded. His load has superplastizer in it, but he doesn't notice. Where he used to work, they stamped the concrete tickets with big red warnings for just about anything non-standard. We don't do that here. Bob, the manager, expects his drivers to read their tickets and consider what they have been loaded with before adjusting, adding water. Jake doesn't look at weights on his ticket. He just pulls out from the loading area, looks at the requested slump on his ticket, looks at his meter and slaps the water button like a colicky baby. Of course, by the time he goes back to check his slump meter, the water reducer has mixed in, and with the extra water, the load is now piss wet. NB. That is the actual term management uses for concrete that wet. Management is mostly comprised of former drivers. Jake calls Bob and says he needs his load dried up. It's simple enough to do. You just drop a little cement with a bit of sand to help push it down. A full load in a mixer is 10 yards, but technically they can hold up to 10.5, so there is some extra room for situations like this. Bob's not too happy that Jake mucked up his load. Jake made a stupid mistake, and now the company has to batch some material we won't be paid for. Still, it happens. So he tells Jake to back up under the plant. Then Jake starts being Jake. He tells Bob that the sand looks wet, and he just wants Bob to drop in some powder. The sand isn't wet. Bob has a moisture sensor telling him the sand isn't wet. What's really going on is that Jake is worried he screwed up the load too much. Either he's panicking, or he's lying about what his meter is reading. Either way, he thinks that one dry up isn't going to be enough, and he wants to make sure there is room for a second one. Bob doesn't hint at his irritation. He just checks the direction of the flag out on the silo, gives Jake the 10-4, and tells him to spin up his drum, 
but to set the drum to full speed and rev the engine to turn it faster. Normally, when Bob loads a truck, he lowers the plant hopper onto the truck's hopper. That lowers the shroud around the back of the truck and turns on the dust collector, a vacuum system that sucks up any stray cement. Bob is not lowering the hopper this time. Instead, Bob loads up some cement powder and, just like Jake asked, drops it. The powder free falls into Jake's truck hopper and billows out in a dark misanthropic cloud. The yard is set up so that the prevailing west winds would normally push that cloud behind Jake's truck and across the yard, and on this occasion, right into my windshield. Instead, a nice, healthy Santa Ana wind, a dry east wind that occasionally blows in Southern California, catches the powder, and Jake's truck gets swallowed by the nothing. When it reappears, Jake's once immaculate truck looks like he's been pouring concrete in Herculaneum. It's been over a year, and Jake hasn't asked for a dry-up since. And now, our final story. I said I didn't have time for that. So, do you want to tell the boss that I'm stranded and on the clock, or can I? First off, a moment of silence for the bandit. He will always be the greatest member of the trucker's film trinity. And with that in mind... We will turn to one of the great banes of every trucker's existence, the Federal Hours of Service Regulations. The HOS rules are so Byzantine and impenetrable that they might as well have been crafted by Anthemius. The full explanation would need animated diagrams and, preferably, narration by John McLeish, but the EL-15 explanation is that all freight drivers have to keep a track of four clocks. Drive clock. 11 hours only counts down while behind the wheel. Resets after a 10-hour break. Duty clock. 14 hours. Counts down when you first go on duty and doesn't stop or reset until you complete a 10-hour break. Break clock. 8 hours. Counts down when you first go on duty and doesn't stop or reset until you complete a half-hour break. Weekly clock, 70 hours, a sum of all time driving or on duty for the past 8 days or since your last 34 hour break, can also be 60 hours over 7 days. If any of these clocks run out, you can no longer drive until you take the appropriate break. Of course, these are only the rules until they aren't, and the regulations have more loopholes than Hijimi Castle. For instance, I am considered a short haul driver which means that in exchange for a number of restrictions on how or where I drive, I don't have to keep my own time log or keep track of my drive clock, unless I work more than 12 hours, in which case I do. I am still limited by the 14-hour duty clock, though once per week. I can extend that to 16 hours. Still, company policy is not to load drivers after they hit 12 hours. It's safest that way. That brings us to Gary, my dispatcher. My old dispatcher Jack had been dumped on scheduling for playing games with how he dispatched drivers. Gary apparently never got that memo. I have met dispatchers who were former drivers. They tend to have a solid idea of the realities of driving. Gary was not one of those dispatchers. Gary saw the world through his tracking map which didn't bother with inconsequential things like traffic or elevations. Trucks were just little blips on his board, and he seemed to delight in moving those blips around. Gary thought of himself as a prankster and a wit. If he had known the word, he might have described himself as puckish. If his drivers had known the word, they would have thought it was one letter off. And that is how I ended up in Corona, California at 1pm on Friday afternoon. I call Gary and tell him that I'm at 11.5 hours and I need to start heading back. Gary needs me to take another load. Their local plant is closed and I'm the only driver available at a neighbouring plant. I pull under, figuring that this is going to be somewhere in Riverside, maybe San Bernardino or Moreno Valley somewhere vaguely in the direction that I'm going. That will let me get my grumble on without actually delaying me too much. It's in Tustin. Tustin is not on my way home. It is in the opposite direction, 
on the other side of a way station. And, of course, I am at a plant with no scale, because trying to send loaded trucks through the Santa Ana Canyon is the kind of employee management you'd normally expect only in Dickens' most unhinged laudanum dreams. Still, dispatch wants me to go. I call my manager, Bob, before I leave to let him know what just happened and that someone is going to have to collect the truck, and me, after this job. I'm certainly not going to brave the scale goblins without being able to check my load, so it's time to partake in the time-honoured trucker pastime of dodging the waste station. I have to go 20 miles out of route and drive through the Orange Crush, which is as much fun on a Friday afternoon as it sounds, to reach the job. For those who live in the area, it meant taking the 71 to the 60, then coming back down the 57. The job itself goes off without a hitch, but now it's after 3pm. I have half an hour before I can no longer legally drive, and I am on the wrong side of the Santa Ana Canyon, which at this hour is moving at about the same speed as my aunt on her rascal. I call Gary to let him know that I won't be making it back home to my home plant, and he sounds a little cowed. It turns out Bob called the regional manager and the regional manager called the operations manager. The operations manager called Gary. From what I gather, he called him many things. Gary asks, practically pleading, if I can make it back by 16 hours. I can't. Not through the traffic I'm facing. But that's a moot point. With malicious cheerfulness, I remind him that I blew my 16-hour exception on Tuesday when he decided to send me on a late afternoon run-up to Joshua Tree. I've just got enough time to get my truck someplace safe and park it. When they figure out how to get me back, they'll find me at the crab cooker just off the 55 freeway in Tustin. There had been several night pours the previous night. That was why I had started at 1.30am. As a result, they don't have anyone with the hours to make the round trip to Tustin and back, not during rush hour. In the end, they find a rock hauler who had a tanker endorsement on his licence. Mixers need a Class B licence with tankers. Rock trucks need a Class A with doubles and triples. Coming on for night shift. Bob offers to drive him out and bring me back. By the time I clocked out, I am over 18 hours for the day. Bob got overtime for the trip out and back, and he told me to just stay home Saturday. Last I heard... Gary had been moved from dispatch to IT. Well, friends, I definitely enjoyed bringing you that collection. If you do know of any other really great Redditors, let me know and I'll have a look and see if I can add a collection of theirs. Anyway, let me know what you think below. And until next time, so long, farewell, pip pip, cheerio, much love, and bye.